Hey, this is Sandy. And Randy. And we're here on AT Corner. Being an athletic trainer comes with ups and downs, and we're here to showcase them all. Join us as we share our world in sports medicine. Welcome back to another episode of AT Corner, episode number 50. This is a big episode, but we're going back to the basics with ankle sprains. Yes, you know what's... A lot of the reading that I did, ankle sprains are one of the most common musculoskeletal conditions out there in the athletic population. I think it's good that we learn it first. Yes, absolutely. But then some students will always be like, why do we save low back first or uh, save low back to the very end? Because then they're like, oh, man, now I feel uncomfortable. Yeah, but that one's one's a little bit more complex. (laughs) That is very true. So with this episode, we're hoping it'll be fairly quick. Um, we'll review the ligamentous anatomy of the ankle and subtalar joint. That is going to be very important in lateral ankle sprains. Uh, we'll discuss the evaluation of the lateral ankle sprain and chronic ankle instability. And then we'll discuss the management and return to play post ankle sprain. So if you guys are new, basically what we do in our education episodes, which are our even numbered episodes, we, Randy does a lot of reading. He takes all those articles. I think, what'd you have for this? How many did you read? 15. So he took about 15 articles from this, and we're going to condense them down, make them conversational, and then we're going to briefly go through how what we've seen in our, in our clinical experience and bring that in. So like I said, the thing with lateral ankle sprains are everyone sees them. Everyone deals with them. They're very common, and we want to break it down back to the basics about what we're exactly looking at. So of course... The two biggest ligaments that we talk about when we're talking about ankle sprains, one, the ATFL, so the anterior talofibular ligament. This ligament prevents anterior talar translation, but what a lot of people don't consider is it also prevents internal rotation of the talus. That's actually a very important motion that happens during an inversion ankle sprain. That talus likes to internally rotate, and that will be important as we talk about the management of ankle sprains. What I found very interesting from my reading is compared to the CFL, this ligament's pretty weak. It doesn't take a lot of force for the ligament to fail, which is kind of a bummer when you think about inversion ankle sprains. Yeah, because that's the primary thing that's preventing that talus from translating. Yeah, they were actually saying once the ankle's in dorsiflexion, the CFL is almost three and a half times stronger than the ATFL. Yeah, I can't I can't really say that I've seen too many CFL sprains. Yeah. And this is probably why, because it's way stronger. Yeah, absolutely. And then that leads into our next one, the CFL, the calcaneofibular ligament. Uh, what a lot of people don't consider is this is a significant stabilizer of the subtalar joint itself. As we go through this episode, you're going to see that the subtalar joint is just as important as the talocrural joint when we're talking about ankle sprains. That's one thing I got to say when I'm working with students is I feel like we forget about the subtalar joint so much and what it does. So really fast, the subtalar joint does inversion and eversion. So keep that in mind when you are looking at someone's motion in the ankle, that's the primary motion of that joint. So with that being said, the CFL is a primary stabilizer for supination and also inversion as well as the ankle is going into dorsiflexion. So A lot of people think of an inversion mechanism as being plantar flexion and inversion, but you can still, that's not the only way to sprain your ankle. You can also have it with a kind of supination inversion without a lot of plantar flexion as the mechanism. And that's where you'll start seeing the CFL getting damaged as well. To highlight the importance of the subtalar joint, and there are a lot of smaller ligaments that interact here, but one that I felt was very important from my reading and I'm pretty sure never gets talked about because I didn't know about this either until I read about it. The interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. Have you heard of that one? The only thing that, I mean, it's tripped me up because you said interosseous, something like the interosseous membrane. (laughs) I don't know specifically about the, what is it, talocalcaneal ligament? Yeah, so this one is actually just under the talus. And it's right around between the talus and the calcaneus. So it's really small and it's in between those bones, hence the interosseous part. And the idea behind this one is it's a multiplanar stabilizer of the subtalar joint. How it was compared is it kind of has the same function as the ACL in the knee. Interesting. That's a good analogy. Right? It's a pretty important deal. And it may not be necessarily be for so much the stabilization part, but also what we forget about the ACL itself is There's a lot of proprioceptive information being relayed. So 
This ligament to be compared to that tells you how important it is not only for just stabilizing the subtalar joint, but also for uh, delivering proprioceptive information to the brain and helping the motor system understand where the ankle is and how to control it. That's also going to be important as we keep going and talk about ankle instability. But the reason I wanted to bring this one up is you're like, okay, well, it's a subtalar ligament. I don't even know. I've never even heard of it. No one talks about it. So why is it important? So that's where I'm going with it. Yeah. And how am I ever going to test this? Right. But they've reported that this ligament can actually be damaged in up to a quarter, all the way up to 80% of lateral ankle sprains that have involved the CFL. So if you're seeing someone with that CFL pain and you test it and like, oh yeah, that CFL is damaged, you could probably bet this is damaged as well. So that just tells you, one, the interrelationship between these larger ligaments and the smaller ligaments that support the tail curl joint and sub tailor joint, but also the more severe the sprain, there's more than just those two ligaments damaged. Well, and going back, you said the CFL is stronger, right? So if you think, if you already got past the ATFL and you injured the CFL, which is stronger, then you probably are safe to say there's probably more damage, which is where the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament comes in. Absolutely. So let's move on to evaluation. So now that you have the person, you know, the athlete or the patient come in with an ankle sprain, now we got to evaluate them. And some of it is we all kind of understand the basics of the acute evaluation and acute ankle sprain. We kind of know how, where we're going to go through there. It becomes more difficult when you start talking about someone who has a history of ankle sprain and you're suspecting someone with chronic ankle instability. The biggest things are you want to know their mechanism. How did they do it? Were they, did they land on someone? Were they just stepping and trying to cut when their ankle gave out? That's kind of interesting because it really helps you get an idea of, am I anticipating CFL damage? Of course, you want to see how they look as well. The amount of swelling, the amount of bruising, all that has been shown to really dictate the severity of an ankle sprain that you're looking at the more severe you're probably looking at the more ligaments involved you want to get a prior history of of this patient and have they had an ankle sprain before if so how many is this someone who has like oh i have ankle sprains all the time well then you probably have ankle instability i can probably just guess but also how long did it take them to heal how severe were they um gaining that idea of of what they felt in the past and what they feel now can actually help guide your treatment and how much you're thinking this is severe. Um, another thing that came up is a history of any feelings of giving away. And this is especially important when you're coming, have someone who has chronic ankle sprain, someone who you're suspecting of having ankle instability, they will often report that their ankle feels weak or they have repeated feelings of like, oh, my ankle wants to give out. That's a big indication of someone who may have instability. And there are actually really great Uh, patient reported outcomes that can help diagnose ankle instability whether it's the cumberland ankle instability tool um and i think the another one is called the ankle instability index or something like that they're the one that's most common that i always see is the cumberland ankle instability tool and these are great tools to help you identify someone who may be diagnosed with chronic ankle instability the next phase of our evaluation is obviously palpation right And as we all know, the Ottawa ankle rules are a great way to kickstart your palpation. If you feel like, I don't know where to start, start there. It's a really good tool to help guide what you're palpating and can help your clinical decision making. Honestly, I didn't really think about it, but now that you're talking about it, that's how I do my ankle eval. Those are the first three things I palpate. Yeah, it just gets the ball rolling, especially for the newly certified out there and you're getting a little nervous. Hey, start there. That's a good good place to start. You get to rule out fracture really quick or start suspecting that there might be a fracture involved. So always remember those. Um, for our BOC, you want to go over what the auto ankle rules are? Yeah, so the auto ankle rules essentially are a clinical prediction rule that helps you make the decision if someone needs to be referred for an x-ray or if they don't need an x-ray. Essentially what you're looking for, if there's any tenderness on the distal end of the fibula or the lateral malleolus or the medial malleolus as well, tenderness over the base of the fifth, tenderness over the navicular tuberosity, and if they have an inability to walk four steps. If if any of those are positive, you should refer them for an x-ray. If all of them are negative, you have a good chance to rule out fracture and they may not need imaging all right let's talk about let's go back to the subtalar joint yes so like we said the subtalar joint is going to play a huge role 
in how you treat an ankle sprain and how you treat instability. So you definitely want to palpate around the subtalar joint, getting into the medial side, the lateral side, testing the mobility, testing any for any laxity or how their motion is, looking at posture, looking at gait. So definitely don't forget the subtalar joint in this process, especially if you're looking for are they do they have rear foot valgus, varus, all that can play a role into how you're going to treat your patient or athlete. Just a pro tip, after you guys are done listening to this, you should go ahead and look up on YouTube how to do a subtalar joint mobilization because those actually are very helpful in treating if if you find that someone is stuck in subtalar motion in that inversion eversion um, the mobilization is super super easy and it's a really great tool that you can use in a lot of your patients that you probably don't even realize and speaking of mobilization you also want to look at the health of the navicular and the cuboid because like we said the subtalar joint can have a huge role well what else articulates with the calcaneus with the talus you're looking at the navicular and the cuboid so an ankle sprain is a pretty traumatic event and it's very forceful in the ankle. If any of those bones have shifted their position or have rotated or anything like that, it's going to affect how the ankle and the forefoot or and the rear foot and midfoot move. That's going to affect how quickly that pain is going to decrease and what impairments you'll see from the patient or the student athlete. Well, I got to say there are so many bones in your feet that it's almost like princess in the pea. One thing is just moved just slightly and then you feel it. Everything's out. Of, it feels like everything's out of place. That motion is off in all. It affects all the other bones because everything's connected. So just that one little motion, if you can find what's causing that, then that's going to be a big part of your treatment. Princess in the pea? You don't know princess in the pea? I've never heard of that expression at all. Really like the story where the princess is sleeping in her bed and she can't get comfortable because there's a pee underneath her mattress and she feels it i've never heard this before we're gonna look this up after the podcast okay please. i i i can't be the only one there's I, there's no way that's real i definitely use that phrase all the time <laughs> so i don't know i've not heard this so after you have a good idea of what's wrong about just by touching these structures you obviously we're gonna jump into special tests Students love special tests. I know you guys do. Everyone knows anterior drawer, right? That's really one of the first ones everyone jumps to when they look at um, a lateral ankle sprain. And the metrics on it are are very good. It's it's a pretty good test to identify damage to the ATFL. There was one that I didn't know about when I was reading up, and it really sounded interesting to me. It's called the anterolateral drawer test. Essentially, it's the same thing as the anterior drawer, except for the thumb on the hand that would normally translate that calcaneus and talus forward is now on the, you're actually palpating that sinus tarsi. So the idea is when you put the drawer motion, that thumb is detecting how far the talus is coming out. So it gives you an idea of how much laxity there is in the joint. Unfortunately, there's really no metrics on it for actual patients. They've only tested this special test on cadavers, which I thought was very interesting. Oh, interesting. Right? So there's still a lot of support that needs to be discovered for this, but it's something to keep in mind when if you are if you have someone who didn't have an acute ankle sprain and they're complaining of something more chronic, sometimes anterior drawer is kind of like, I didn't really feel, I didn't really get the information I wanted from it. This is another way you can do it just by moving that thumb into the sinus tarsi and then detecting how much that talus comes out and then comparing that to the uninvolved leg. And then, of course, we always talk about the Taylor Tilt, Kligers, some people like Cotton's test. There's a lot of tests that you can go for. Essentially, you're just really trying to stress that joint and understand where the mobility is coming from. Um, again, do not overlook the subtalar joint. It may be hard in an acute setting because of pain and you can't really weight bear. So chronic for sure, but also subacute. As someone's starting to get better, that gives you another chance to as we should always be reevaluating our patients each time they come in, that gives you another opportunity to, okay, your pain's getting, you know, is decreasing. You're getting more functional. You're getting better. Let's look to see what subtalar joint issues that we're seeing here and what we can affect in our rehab. And then also just going above and below the joint, look at that motion in the big toe. Look at the motion in the calf. Do you need to work on those things? Were they in a boot? If they're in a boot, more than likely, you're going to have to do some work on that calf because it's not doing what it usually does with your toe off and with your push off. So 
making sure that you're not too tunnel visioned into that ankle. You want to you want to look up and down the chain. Absolutely. The hips play a huge role in the treatment of ankle sprains and even the prevention of ankle sprains. You know, poor glute control, having weak glutes has been shown to be a risk factor for developing a lateral ankle sprain. And then also post ankle sprain, they've shown that the glute meat activity actually decreases. So that's something that you'll want to address. So definitely look above but above and below, like like you said. Well, you know, it's actually perfect that we can work on core with everything and, and glutes because if someone is coming in with a really acute ankle sprain and you really can't start to work on that ankle, glutes, go ahead and start working on those. They can do sideline stuff. They can do um, band work. They can do core work, all of that. Yeah, absolutely. So like we said, this could really dictate how you treat your patient and where you want to go and how their return to play will look. And as you go into the management, there's a lot of good evidence out there. And it's actually in a lot of clinical practice guidelines. And also the position statement from the NATA on ankle sprains is early mobilization is leads to better outcomes rather than just being totally mobilized. But also I would add the caveat that it has to be safe mobilization. So if someone comes in with a lateral ankle sprain and they can barely walk, you're not just going to tell them like, okay, well, just keep walking on it. Good luck. (laughs) Because they're still stressing the ligament, obviously. That's not necessarily beneficial. So when people talk about early mobilization, they're talking about it's still braced. Either they're wearing a stirrup brace or they're in a boot. Um, Obviously, the boots can be a little more immobilizing, but what you're trying to do is you're trying to protect those ligaments that are healing you don't want to overly stress them or they're just going to be stuck in that inflammatory phase and you're not going to get great outcomes from that Um, i believe the number that i saw is if you have to boot someone they really don't want them in a boot for more than 10 days so it's really trying to get these kids out of something that's immobilized to get them mobile again and just because okay yes they're not weight bearing and you have them in a boot and they're fairly immobilized at that point that doesn't mean you can't work on mobility stuff safely you can still work on your range of motion within within the limits of pain you could do your joint mobilization starting with the lower grades and then moving up from there um i i know there's one important thing that we were talking about before we were recording was the position of the lateral malleolus and the talus can be shifted after an ankle sprain yeah so we were actually like Randy said, we were just talking about this because a lot of people think like when the ligament's stressed, it's just pulling on um, one side, but you got to remember ligaments attach to two places. They attach to two bones and they pull those two bones together. So if you have an ankle sprain and the ATFL is pulling on the talus, you got to remember what else could it be pulling on? It could be pulling on the fibula causing an anterior translation. So if you go back, even it's in the NATA position statement too, you should be doing posterior fibular mobs because if it's indicated in the patient, because that fibula could have been involved in an anterior translation. And that's also the same for the talus. They've actually done studies where, you know, we all obviously know dorsiflexion range of motion is going to be inhibited during an ankle sprain, but even after the ankle sprain has assumed to be healed, they still have deficits in dorsiflexion range of motion. And some of that is coming from not necessarily tightness from the calf or anything, but the actual joint is tight and the talus is not gliding posterior like it should during dorsiflexion. So they've shown that the talus can be stuck in into anterior translation or even a little internal rotation. That's also going to affect how much dorsiflexion there's going to be available. So Definitely working on your anterior posterior mobs for the ankle will also help to increase that dorsiflexion range of motion. And that's where a lot of the premise of the mulligan mobilizations for the ankle and the fibula um, have come into play are those positional fault ideas. So definitely, I would say if you haven't taken a mulligan course yet, I would highly recommend. We enjoyed it. We very much. Honestly, it's probably the best course that I have taken that I have actually taken so much from and changed like probably I used at least 70% of what we learned it was very if not more it was very applicable and it was very very applicable it was stuff that you could take from that day and immediately apply so it it was pretty awesome and that's essentially where the a lot of that premise came from is adjusting those positional faults now some research is a little debated on that part but it is a possibility and Evidence does support the range of motion deficits, and we know joint mobilization can help with range of motion as well. 
And like we talked about before, literature can say whatever it wants, but also you got to take into your, your, into your consideration your clinical experience. And if those have worked for you clinically, then don't stop doing them because the literature says. Absolutely. And in your rehab, you're going to address other impairments based on your evaluation. Like I said, poor glute control is a risk factor for lateral ankle sprain, for chronic ankle instability. Um, it's present after an ankle sprain, so you want to be able to remedy remedy that and not return them after ankle pain's gone with poor glute control because now they're, one, predisposed to another ankle sprain, but also a whole array of musculoskeletal issues because of poor, poor glute control. Everyone knows, everyone's favorite when we're talking about ankle sprains are the balance exercises, right? We always have people balance, right? But proprioception is huge in controlling the position of the ankle, like we said, and what we've said before on a lot of other musculoskeletal conditions, the motor system and the sen- or the sensory motor system as a whole changes because of injury. And we already talked about if there's damage to these ligaments, the brain has lost proprioceptive information. It doesn't know where it is in space as well as it used to um, post-injury. So that the brain's trying to get that information from somewhere else, and it really jacks up the motor system and how it protects these joints. So proprioception is going to be key. And that's not just from a balance standpoint. You can use PNF. PNF is a great way to help normalize the sensory motor system and get that ball rolling as well. Also, with the lack of sensory motor control, obviously the tail end of that word is the motor aspect. And there have been motor deficits detected in those with chronic ankle instability that we need to address. A lack of excitability to those everters, which we know the everters protect from inversion uh, motion. So that's going to help protect that ligament. So essentially we want to strengthen around that ankle and we want to get everything firing correctly and optimally. Also remembering that a lot of times if you are finding a muscle that is weak or tight, those kind of correlate together. So a lot of times these everters might be tight and weak. Yeah, absolutely. Tightness doesn't necessarily mean shortened. It could also mean underactive as well. And that's something that often gets forgot about as well. Once you have this rehab done, we want to make sure we're returning athletes to play when they're ready to go. So as we said, with other conditions, you really want to test them, not just from a pain standpoint, but test their strength. How is their coordination? How's their athletic performance and functional performance? You know, if you're doing uh, hop testing, can they reach the same level as a baseline or reach the same level within about 10% of their uninvolved leg. Um, why balance tests could be another one. Are they able to reach as far as they used to, or can they reach to the same as the uninvolved limb have some kind of criteria that you can go off of to be like, yes, this person has really reached their baseline and function. They can get back to play. Yeah. And honestly, you guys, we just went over the basic, basic, basics of ankle sprains in the literature. So we didn't even talk about the different modalities you can use. And honestly, ankle sprains are very, very broad and they present very differently in very, in different cases, especially because like we were saying, there are so many bones that can be shifted and so many different aspects of, and so many different joints and everything in the ankle. That Absolutely. Can just... And also what was very interesting is a lot of these studies did follow-ups for about six months to a year and chronic ankle instability can develop in any time window from there. So what was highly recommended, what I thought was interesting that, you know, I might start implementing as well is they recommended someone getting some kind of external bracing up to a year post initial ankle sprain to help facilitate that protection as someone works on their, their rehab and stuff like that. So consider having your athlete that post ankle sprain, maybe for that year or so, they're going to be in an ankle brace or maybe being taped or something. It's going to help protect them while they're rehabbing to get them back to where they need to. And it can help give them some stability in that time as well and help protect from re-injury. And that's huge. Have you done any reading on, on bracing and how that affects like muscle activity? So a lot of people do use that as a a negative towards taping or bracing that, oh, well, you're going to make them too reliant on it and it's going to affect their activation or their strength. And there's actually not a lot of support for that comment. Um, As long as I would say, as long as there's the rehab that's backing it up, I don't think it will affect them too much. Maybe if it's someone who's like not doing anything, okay, maybe they'll become a little more reliant because 
they still aren't getting all the proprioceptive information because of an external brace. But as long as they're being rehabbed, I think you can be pretty confident that they can still brace for up like that entire year and you'll still see gains in strength and see a good outcome from it. Yeah, especially when you have those teams who are they brace their entire team. Yeah, I mean, that definitely happens. And it's not a bad idea. It's just sometimes not all the kids like to wear a brace. Or, or if some, they're wearing it wrong, that's that's really that's also too. bad as well. Yeah, it should be a properly fitted brace. So our action item from today, if you have not gotten the theme of this episode, probably I would say it's mobilizations. Look at what joint is being affected and learn your mobilizations. Would you do you have a different action item, Randy? And then also just remember that you gotta take each patient individually you need to understand their impairments and get a good rehab developed for them the mobilizations are going to be key early on and you can start using them for someone who has chronic deficits but also the rehab is going to be key for you and you really want to strengthen around that joint and also the lower extremity in general to help protect it oh i like that short and sweet so you guys if you want to do more reading like randy We're actually going to put our citations for this, or I should say Randy's citations, on our website, and those will be in the show notes below. We we do it for every episode, but we never say it. So if you're new, you can go ahead and go down to the show notes below. You just scroll down. And then also, if you want to do more listening to continuing education on ankle sprains. It is a reporting year. The CEUs are coming. We do have, um, there are some great ankle sprain continuing education on medbridge which is a continuing education website for athletic trainers pts OTs. ot's nurses there's a ton of different healthcare professionals that they're um, approved for and we actually have a 175 dollar off code for you guys it is at corner it is also down in the show notes below and we have a link too so you can click on that and i think they also have a free trial so you can also like check out some of their ceus for free so make sure you check that out and we have a facebook group if you're not part of it yet this week we're going to be asking you guys about your favorite ankle sprain rehab so if you want to get some ideas go ahead and go over to our facebook group where we're going to have a thread of those and then lastly every other episode is education or stories this was an education episode next week we're going back to our stories so make sure you stay tuned for that or head over to instagram where we ask you guys for your stories have anything else to add randy nope that was perfect thank you for helping us showcase athletic training behind the tape bye